Howdy, y'all. Joe Hills here, recording as I always do in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'd like to welcome you to Minecraft Morning Musings. This morning, we're going to look at the second chapter of James Legg's 1891 translation of Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching, which addresses contrasts, constructs, and introduces the concept of the sage. In the meantime, I plan to address some fun quirks of the Chinese language that make it really easy for a sentence to mean a lot of things, some of which are really rude and not at all obvious, or some of which are pretty rude if you actually speak Chinese and are obvious if you speak Chinese. But, you know, stuff gets lost in translations. So anyway, since this is a long chapter, I'm going to read you the first few verses, compare those to a different translation by a fellow by the name of D.T. Suzuki, and then I'll cover the rest. So here we go. First few lines from James Legg's 1891 translation. All in the world know the beauty of the beautiful, and in doing this, they have the idea of what ugliness is. They all know the skill of the skillful, and in doing this, they have the idea of what the want of skill is. That seems pretty straightforward, right? You know, Leg is pretty much saying measures like beauty and skill are defined in relation to their extremes. You know, uh, how could we describe the appearance appearance of comedienne Betty White if we lacked the continuum between Ugly Betty and Betty Boop? Or how could we describe the skill of the basketball playing Lady Vols without the continuum from Lady Macbeth to Lady Gaga? Now... One of the neat things about Chinese characters is that each character can convey multiple shades of meaning and linguistic depth, which in turn leaves translators with a few options as to what they would emphasize in their interpretation. Now, back in 1913, D.T. Suzuki translated the very same lines as, Everywhere it is obvious that if beauty makes a display of beauty, it is sheer ugliness. It is obvious that if goodness makes a display of goodness, it is sheer badness. Now, I like Suzuki's translation a bit more than Legs because of its bite. It's not only a definition, but, you know, a condemnation as well. And if you're going to write about universal truths, I figure you may as well chide some people in the universe occasionally, if not subtly. Now, of course, the original Chinese... Oh man, I need to hide my hood. Of course, the original Chinese is a more nuanced combination of the two, um, which I won't even attempt to pronounce, but if I did attempt to pronounce it, it would start out a little bit like this. Tian shu jie zhu mei zhu wei mei. And that's why I'm using the English translations for all of this rather than the actual original Chinese. Anyway, proceeding with James Legg's 1891 translation... So it is that existence and non-existence give birth the one to the idea of the other, that difficulty and ease produce the one the idea of the other, that length and shortness fashion out the one the figure of the other, that the ideas of height and lowness arise from the contrast of one with the other, that the musical notes and tones become harmonious through the relation of one with another and that being before and behind give the idea of one following another. And what Lao Tzu has listed here is a series of examples of how things are defined by the perception of their opposites. If you looked at the original Chinese characters for this, like each of those sentences or phrases is like three characters. It's just that taking these concepts and making them Englishified is absolutely insane. So, Anyway, Lao Tzu listed so many examples of this that I feel like I should not patronize you by giving further examples, but I normally would anyway to be humorously antagonistic, though the ones I came up with weren't funny enough. So I'm just going to move right along. So in the next part of this uh, chapter, Lao Tzu introduces the idea of the sage, a kind of ideal or wise leader. Different translations use different terms for the sage. Suzuki calls him the holy man, J.H. MacDonald calls her the master, and Goddard, who we haven't really talked about much, calls him the wise man. Personally, I prefer the word sage, which Leg uses in the following second half of chapter 2. Therefore, the sage manages affairs without doing anything, 
and conveys his instructions without the use of speech. All things spring up, and there is not one which declines to show itself. They grow, and there is no claim made for their ownership. They go through their processes, and there is no expectation of a reward for the results. The work is accomplished, and there is no rest in, in it as an achievement. The work is done, but how, no one can see. Tis this that makes the power not cease to be. Now, first, let's address the doing as little as possible part. Now, this isn't an excuse for folks to sit around all day in the pizzeria playing Pac-Man and folding up the slices of pizza to make them easier to eat or dabbing them with their little napkins to make the calories less or oils. I don't know what you're actually removing with the napkin. It's probably mostly cheese and sauce, which is like half the point of pizza, so don't do that. Anyway, sidetracked. The sage is a leader, and this is an intentional leadership-style choice. Instead of micromanaging and regulating and pushing and shoving and pulling and just being a jerk to assert himself in any given process, the sage acts precisely when necessary, uh, allowing his subordinates to perform to their potential. So, a lot of the lessons of the sage, you know, are helpful when you're in leadership situations, but you can't necessarily, you know, use them as an excuse to be lazy, because there's a big difference between being a non-micromanaging boss and someone who never does anything. But, um, for the last two lines, though, the work is done, but how no one can see, tis this that makes the power not cease to be. First off, I'm going to say, I don't always love the little rhyming bits that James Legg likes to put at the end of each chapter, but he essentially just established that the accomplishments of the sage can endure because the sage takes as little credit as possible. Now, this might seem counterintuitive. You know, uh, it's easy to see how upfront letting his team keep the credit will help them to be successful in accomplishing whatever their goals are. But why would the long-term endurance of whatever they created or whatever their works were be affected? Well, okay, for one thing, the team might be, you know, collectively working harder or better to create something with better staying power just because they feel more invested in it. You know, they're not just phoning it in, they're coming in, they know they're a part of something exciting, they have the freedom to create something that's going to be awesome, and so then they go out and do it, you know? And the second part of this, uh, you'll have to excuse me, I got a little bit of a political example here. Now, in American politics, and I'd wager politics anywhere with a multi-party system, one of the greatest uh, challenges for long-term projects, you know, like multiple decade projects, like we want to build a huge tunnel or a huge bridge or a rail line that goes for hundreds of miles, things like that take so long that uh, one party might say, okay, well, this will take 20 years to do. And they put the plan into motion, and then, you know, it's politics. People and parties get rotated in and out, and all of a sudden, when the opposing party comes into power, the first thing they want to do is cut the big infrastructure project that the other party set up, because it makes the other party look like idiots. It's like, oh, yeah, they wanted to build this bridge, but the bridge is over budget. We're not going to do that. Um, we're going to cut our losses here, or we're going to mess with the project because we want to have the ultimate success of the project be on us, you know, because if they can say, oh yeah, well, our threats to cancel the project led to a streamlining that ultimately resulted in a better bridge. Well, you know what? That's kind of part of the problem because maybe it didn't really lead to a better bridge. Maybe it led to a worse bridge, but hey, you got your name on it. And so it's not particularly sagely to come in and just screw with other people's projects like that. And uh, now, if the party that initially created the bridge did not, like, really try to put their name all over it, if they didn't want to say, like, this is our party's bridge, we're doing great, but, like, if they go out of their way to involve everyone, they get the community involved, they get people across party lines involved, you know, um, it's a lot easier for something like that to endure and to work out properly. So, anyway, that was the long and short of Chapter 2 of the Tao Te Ching. Uh, in future videos, we'll revisit the concept of the sage, the importance of discerning when to act and when to wait, and we'll explore other aspects of the Tao as well. You know, since this is a new series, I'd really appreciate it if you could click thumbs up or thumbs down each episode, uh, leave me feedback in the comments, and uh, tell your friends about what I'm doing. So, anyway... 
Until next time, y'all, this is Joe Hills from Nashville, Tennessee. Keep adventuring. Also, if you guys want to let me know if I'm rereading the same verse too many times or if I'm not reading them enough times, feel free to let me know that too. This whole thing is a huge experiment, and I want you to feel invested in its success. See, I learned something today. I should probably not smash into that spire either.